For years, the Mafia was able to operate outside of the law, and the FBI didn't care. Now, Hoover, for a long time, had taken advantage of an American law. The federal, federal investigators could, uh, the, the law that was written on wiretapping and, uh, and bugs was simply this. The federal law said intercept, but not disclose. So the idea simply was Hoover had been getting a lot of uh, taps and bugs, found out a lot about the mafia. But Joe Valachi was the first mobster to break Omerta the Mafia's strict code of silence. He revealed the true meaning of the phrase, La Cosa Nostra, and gave the police the inside scoop on how the American Mafia was organized and controlled. The Lachi was a rat. It was the first time anyone could pull back the curtain or paint the canvas of what it was like. I think what the Lachi did was explain what the FBI had and didn't know they had. And so the FBI had tapes, they had relationships between individuals, they had terms, they had words in both English and Italian that they didn't understand. And Valachi was able to make sense out of all of that. Valachi's testimony would force the feds into action and the mob into retaliation. But Joe Valachi was not very smart. And his bosses in the Luciano family and later the Genovese family recognized this. And he was also um, a person who was bitter. This is Mafia. In June 1962, in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, Don Vito Genovese sat in his cell. After waiting nearly 20 years to become head of his crime family, he had finally done it, only to be in prison. The mafia boss had been sentenced to 15 years for drug trafficking, but many believed he had been convicted under mysterious circumstances, including Genovese himself, and he was desperate to get the real story. So when Rab is the author of Five Families. Many people thought it was a really tainted conviction because the major evidence against him was one individual, a person who claimed he had been a courier between uh, the narcotics base in uh, East Harlem and also with Genovese. Why would he even engage in a conversation with him, especially somebody who is paranoid as Genovese was, to do anything like that and distrustful? Imprisoned along with him was 58-year-old Joe Valachi, a Genovese family soldier. Ronald Goldstock is a former FBI agent. The soldiers didn't have a job. They had an opportunity. Uh, they can be a labor racketeer. They can be an expert in a particular industry. Um, and the people that work with him are known as mob associates. And the end result is that a soldier um, makes money and passes some of the money up to um, his superiors, the uh, capo and, and the underboss, the boss. Um, the better a soldier is, the more likely he is to be promoted. Valachi had the same conviction and sentence as Genovese, and the two had been both working for the same family. After a time, the two became cellmates, but even before that, they had a long history. Joe went back a long time with Vito. He was in one of Vito's crews, so they knew each other very well. And he'd always been dependent upon the Vito's goodwill. And he always thought he was in Vito's good graces. So here they wind up together in the Atlanta pen. And uh, Vito, of course, is courted as a big mobster. He has, he has people surrounding him. They take care of his food, his job. He doesn't have to do anything. Uh, Joe is in another element. Joe has to really work. And uh, he's no big shot. Uh, but Vito was a homicidal maniac, a paranoid who trusted nobody. And for some reason, he got suspicious that, that uh, Valachi was a rat. One morning, Valachi was met with a surprise. Don Vito Genovese approached him and kissed him on both cheeks. But rather than taking it as a sign of affection, Valachi feared for his life. Joe recognized immediately the kiss of death. 
For no reason, he bestowed a, a, a bus on his cheek. And Joe knew what this meant. It meant he was now going to be killed. One way or the other, Vito was out to get him, and he had sent him a message. In all likelihood, it was police corruption that played a part in Genovese's conviction. But he had still become convinced that Valachi was responsible. And Valachi was sure the kiss of death meant Genovese had marked him as a dead man. Even in prison, Genovese's reaches were far and wide. A hit could come at any time from anywhere. But what had Valachi done to earn a special hit contract? Nothing. Yet. Joe Valachi joined Cosa Nostra in 1930. His family came over to New York from Naples in the 1900s. They had 17 children, and Joe was one of only six who survived. By the time he was 18, Valachi was the driver of a notorious gang called the Minutemen, a gang of petty robbers. But Valachi was convicted of theft and sent to the infamous Sing Sing prison. Inside the prison, Valachi made friends with a gangster named Alessandro Valero. It was then that Valachi first learned about the organization known as La Cosa Nostra. And Valachi wanted to be a part of it. Douglas Valentine is a historian and journalist. And he was a, 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 ma a member of the Mafia, I think, since 1930, very early. Um, and he certainly was greedy. But Joe Valachi was not very smart. And his bosses in the Luciano family and later the Genovese family recognized this. And he was also a, um, a, a person who was bitter. His resolve only strengthened when he left prison to find his old gang had replaced him. Valachi started as a mafia soldier in the Lucchese family. Former NYPD officer Joe Coffey explained that soldiers were usually given the work no one else wanted to do. Soldiers in a mob are wannabes. They start out as wannabes. The only way to get it is to become part of that mob, so you start at a low level and you start doing business. You start out as a runner for a gambler, or a pickup man for a loan shot, or you become a guy who hijacks airplanes at Kennedy Airport. You become a low-level gangster. Then you graduate, and you either become an earner or a hitman. Now, either way, either path, earner, make a lot of money for them, or a hitman, get you made. Contrary to public belief, you don't have to whack somebody to get made. If you earn them a lot of money, you have a scheme that you're working that's bringing a lot of money and you get made. Makes sense. Based on past experience, Valachi became a driver for one of New York's top mafia gangs, led by Salvatore Maranzano. But soon Maranzano was locked in a bloody power struggle with his rival, Joe Masseria. The struggle ended in the death of Masseria, and Valachi became one of Maranzano's bodyguards until Maranzano himself was executed by Lucky Luciano. Lucky Luciano was the biggest gangster of all time. He had a sense for organization. He was pretty intelligent. He was a pretty sharp guy. Luciano liked being a boss. Luciano liked calling the shots. And he was, uh, he was in his time, a guy who could demand respect across the United States, i.e., the meeting he called in Atlantic City in 1931, everybody responded to him. Some guys who never met him said, this is a good idea. And they came, they listened, and they formed the commission as we know it today. I mean, the guy was good. Valachi was folded into the Luciano family, continuing his work as a soldier, and continued to be a soldier. Within the uh, mafia organizational structure, um, there are uh, family bosses, and then beneath them, there are uh, underbosses. Despite the fact that in the 1950s, Valachi had been in the mafia for over 20 years, he was still just a button man and a crew. He hadn't risen very far. Valachi had attained his goal of being a made man in the mafia, but he hadn't gotten any further than that. 
It seemed as though Valachi was constantly being passed over for promotions. Vinnie Morrow had been um, Valachi's protege, but he had been promoted above Valachi. And uh, Vinnie Morrow and Frank Caruso kept, they suppressed Valachi. They let him have a couple of jukeboxes that he was able to make money from. And because they officially just let him have those jukeboxes to make money, he was, in a sense, forced into drug business, okay? Very few people feel an inclination to be a drug trafficker. In the mafia, you're generally forced into that business. And Valachi was a person who was forced, uh, through economic reasons of his bosses, into, into drug trafficking. And he, he sold narcotics uh, in Harlem. The drug trade was a less desirable charge among the Mafia rackets. It was easier to get caught, and soon enough, Valachi was arrested. Valachi had a reputation for getting busted or arrested for two-bit crimes, and that's what happened. He was always involved in minor narcotics deals. You know, he was never really a big importer or a supplier or the brains behind anything. So he got arrested by the Narcotics Bureau in America and uh, was sentenced to about 15 years. And there he was in his usual uh, second-rate second rate performer, uh, dealing with important people like Vito Genovese, who coincidentally was in on a separate narcotics rack, rap at the same time in one of the darkest and toughest institutions known as the Atlanta Penitentiary, Federal Penitentiary, where only the toughest characters usually wind up. June 22, 1962. Inside Atlanta Penitentiary, it had been several days since Valachi received the kiss of death. His nerves were wearing thin. He sat in the prison yard, as far from other inmates as possible. One of them might be a hired hit. In the far corner of the yard, two prison guards were talking to each other. Then something caught Valachi's eye. The gym equipment was being used by a lone prisoner and the man was staring directly at him. He started towards Valachi, head bowed. The man was slowly coming in closer. And he saw, he believed, one of the, uh, one of Vito's hitmen was out to get him, was coming for him. And he picked up a pipe, an iron pipe. It's hard to believe in a prison apparatus. They would leave a deadly weapon lying around from a construction site. Uh, but Joe was quick with it. He picked up the pipe. And he killed the uh, person he thought was the uh, designated hitman. Turned out he was wrong. And once again, I think Joe was a bit of a bumbler. So he killed the wrong guy. He killed an innocent prisoner who just happened to be walking by. Valache's victim was a man named John Joseph Saup. He was a small-time crook, and he had no mafia connections. Now he's really up against it, because they had him on, the feds would have him on a murder rap. So he would have another 20 or 30 years, he'd never get out of prison. And if he ever didn't, if he, even if he beat the rap, Vito would get rid of him in prison. So here he is, here he is, he's trapped, there's no way out for him. Valachi had killed the wrong person. And now, on top of his narcotics conviction, he was facing a life sentence for murder. The situation was grave for Valachi, but it was a great opportunity for someone else. Attorney General Robert Kennedy was hell-bent on taking down organized crime since his election in 1961. But Kennedy and his staff had been struggling to penetrate the criminal underworld. The Appalachian meeting, where over 100 mobsters had been caught by police, had revealed to the public that the mafia was very real indeed. But the FBI still had made little moves forward. And so they began a program of uh, wiretapping um, and um, trying to determine um, who occupied various positions and how the organization was structured. Um, Kennedy comes in in 1960 as the attorney general for John Kennedy uh, and reinvigorates the organized crime and racketeering section. Now for the first time, they might have found someone from the inside who could be persuaded to talk. Suddenly, here comes along this serendipitous windfall, this two-bit mobster, who can tell of at least 
what it's like to be in the trenches with a mob, how you become a mafioso. He knew about all these things. It was the first time anyone could pull back the curtain or paint the canvas of what it was like. So he was a tremendous star. Here was this guy that had come out of nowhere. It's unknown whether the FBI offered Valachi the choice or if Valachi decided it on his own. But they gave Valachi a deal. If he would disclose what he knew publicly, he wouldn't have to spend his life behind bars. July 17, 1962. In the dead of night, Joe Valachi was awoken in his cell. The lock on the door was slowly being opened from the outside. But it wasn't Hitman. It was the Feds. For his protection, they would be taking him out of Atlanta. Valachi was given the cover of Joseph D. Marcona and flown to Westchester County Jail in New York. He was put into solitary confinement, gave him the, time, gave him the opportunity to think, so what's his only out? He's got to become a rat. So he sends word to the federal authority that he's willing to sing, come a canary. Valachi was put to intense questioning, first at the Bureau of Narcotics. They begin interviewing him, and uh, at first he's not too uh, forthcoming, nothing really good. Steve Pomerantz is a former assistant director at the FBI. But in the process of, um, of uh, telling these things to the Bureau of Narcotics, uh, Bobby Kennedy became aware of his potential, as did other people in the Justice Department, and as a person who could publicize how big and how important the Mafia was. And at that point, um, the FBI stepped in and took over Valachi. Despite his willingness to cooperate, Valachi proved to be hard to crack. And FBI Director Herbert Hoover was desperate for information. After years of inaction against the mob, going so far as to claim they didn't exist, his bureau was facing a lot of criticism. Hoover is interested in him. Now, Hoover, for a long time, had taken advantage of an American law. The federal, federal investigators, could, uh, the, the law that was written on wiretapping and, uh, and bugs was simply this. The federal law said intercept, but not disclose. So the idea simply was Hoover had been getting a lot of uh, taps and bugs, found out a lot about the mafia, about putative mafia members or alleged mafia members, but he could never publicly disclose it. So he had a lot of, in he had information, but he wasn't dealing with it. But he was able to use that information to try to worm things out of uh, Balachi. And he sent in one of his key inquisitors. Hoover sent in FBI agent James P. Flynn to get Balachi to open up. Flynn was a veteran interrogator. Flynn came in and he, he was tough. He told Balachi, listen, either you tell us what we want to know, or you're no value to us and there's no deal involved. And uh, Valachi realized he had to start talking. The truth was that the FBI had a lot of pieces of information. Semi-legal wiretaps had picked up words and phrases that were all but unintelligible. Flynn was intrigued by one phrase in particular. Many suspected mafioso referred to themselves as Cosa Nostra, but the FBI didn't know what the saying meant or actually referred to. To get Valachi to loosen his tongue, Flynn decided to use the art of deception. They weren't sure what it meant. Did it mean our house? Did it mean uh, our place? And uh, Flynn bluffed Valachi. He said, well, you know, we know all about Cosa Nostra. In using the phrase, Valachi assumed the FBI knew more about the mafia than they actually did. And he began to talk. Valachi was shocked. But he, they knew the name. They thought it was so secret because he knew the mob never used the name Mafia when they discussed anything or among themselves. It was sort of the trade name that the press and some law enforcement people had invented. And it was carried over from what existed in Sicily. There was a Mafia in Sicily, but the Mafia in America called itself Cosa Nostra. And he, for the first time, revealed what it really meant. It meant our thing, Cosa Nostra. And that was the name that the and he told Flynn, we never call ourselves mafia. We call ourselves, you know, we're in the Cosa Nostra when we, when we talk about it, if we ever do. So in that sense, he had a breakthrough. 
He finally found out what Cosa Nostra meant. And Valachi, he had to produce an inside story, paint a canvas of what it was like to be a mafia soldier in the trenches. So for the first time, he started spilling the beans. Flynn started to press Valachi for names and dates and how the organization got started. So he became the Rosetta Stone. He uh, interpreted the hieroglyphics. He told them what it all meant, how the uh, organizations functioned, how there were families, how the makeup was, the whole structure. And he actually gave them names of the New York families for the first time. And who were the bosses? Something they didn't know. They may have suspected things, but this was the inside information. The FBI only knew the tip of the iceberg, the mafia iceberg. They really didn't, had never really penetrated the organization and realized the real details of how it functioned. Valachi revealed the organizational structure of the mafia. He detailed how the Cosa Nostra was divided into family units, each with a boss, an underboss, and lieutenants and soldiers beneath them. Um, so the soldier is a, a, a person high up in the mob by the very nature of being admitted to the mob. They are given mob secrets, they are told about what has occurred, they need to know who other people are within the mob because they're free to cross anybody who's outside the mob but no one who's in the mob. Um, and so they tend to know a great deal. Um, and Valachi demonstrated that. Even as a low-level soldier, Valachi still knew who was above him and that these Mafia families extended across America, from Boston to San Francisco. He told them how you got inducted, Omerta, a whole code, a uh, code of silence, uh, how you could never, that once you became a member, you could never leave, how you became inducted, how you had to either become an earner or be a hitman, kill somebody before you could even be qualified to, to be an inductee. So he started pulling aside, and for the first time, he told them the names of the families. They had no idea the five families in New York, who they were. They didn't know who the leaders were. Flynn listened with astonishment. The crime family's sophisticated network was far more powerful than the FBI had predicted. Flynn interrogated Valachi four days a week for almost three months. An average session lasted about three hours until Valachi became tired and irritated. Kennedy realized that Valachi had the potential to provide a gold mine of information on how the American mafias operated. He wanted to conduct public hearings, but he was concerned about the mobster's credibility. How could anyone be sure that he was telling the truth? The Hoover's sitting on a lot of information which he thinks is very revelatory about the mafia, but he can't disclose it because under state laws, he could never, uh, federal law, he could intercept and bug, uh, but he couldn't uh, use it in courtroom evidence. So now he used it for Valachi. The FBI already had a lot of information on suspected mob hits. All they had to do was connect the dots. Flynn tasked the police department with digging up 30 years' worth of information on suspicious murders. They found that Valachi's version of the gang slangs and killings, including the dates, locations, and the circumstances, could all be verified. Valachi was telling the truth. I think what Valachi did was explain what the FBI had and didn't know they had. And so the FBI had tapes, they had relationships between individuals, they had terms, they had words in both English and Italian that they didn't understand. And Valachi was able to make sense out of all of that uh, and was able to identify them by name rather than nickname. But other than that, um, I think Valachi's testimony pretty much stands on its own. I mean, and it has been proven accurate over time. In 1963, Valachi agreed to go public and disclose the secrets of the American Mafia. Valachi was flown to Washington to face an investigating Senate committee on organized crime across America. But Valachi's main fear was that the FBI couldn't protect him from Vito Genovese. And according to FBI sources, members of the Genovese crime family were already tracking him down. From his cell, Vito Genovese had put a price tag on Valachi's head. One hundred thousand dollars.
In the next episode, Valachi would appear in court over two weeks in October, giving first-hand accounts of life as a mafia soldier and hitman. One thing that, that Joe Valachi revealed to law enforcement and to the people in charge of this country was the structure of the mafia, the history of the mafia. He had a vast knowledge of it, and he was the one who exposed it all. The families, the names of the people, the levels of uh, authorities. But sitting in the public light only made him more vulnerable to retaliation. The mob, of course, was horrified. The leaders were horrified by what he had, uh, what he was going to do and by his testimony. And they knew before even he testified that he was going on the witness stand. And the FBI, after getting what they wanted, couldn't protect him forever. Bobby Kennedy had some wild scheme that maybe they could bring uh, Valachi's wife and put him on some desert island where he could live out the rest of his life. But that was impossible. And he still had a sentence for murdering that uh, fellow convict, the wrong man. In Atlantis. I got a pause to sign a